Well, good morning and welcome both local and internet viewers to this May 1, 2022 Sunday School lesson prepared by the NAS at Northlake. Next few lessons are covering part of Paul's ministry as recorded in the book of Acts. <clears throat> Today's lesson is titled, Keep on Speaking, with the subtitle, The Good News of Jesus Can Penetrate the Most Unlikely Places in This World. It is from, uh, it's, just, it's from Acts chapter 18, verses uh, 1 through 20, through, one through 18, and deals with Paul's ministry in the city of Corinth in Greece. Corinth was the largest city in Greece with a population of about 100,000 people. Prior to coming to Corinth, Paul and his companion's strategy was to um, preach the gospel and uh, smaller towns and cities until the opposition became too great and then they moved on. At Corinth, that strategy changed. Paul was in Corinth for about 18 months. Corinth was a large metropolitan city offering all of the good and the bad of big cities. Corinth had the equivalent of a modern mall building that housed up to 33 stores on one floor. They had a concert hall that seated 3,000 and a large theater that seated 18,000. In addition, they had a large amphitheater for gladiator events. And every two years, they hosted athletic events that were only suppressed by the Olympics. The city was located on a narrow isthmus between two harbors, one on the east and one on the west. It was an important trade city, and the trade route from Rome passed through it. There was wealth to be made in Corinth, and goods from all over the world were available. The other thing that Corinth was well known for was the temple dedicated to Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of sexual love and beauty which was said to house 1,000 sacred prostitutes. In addition, there were many other pagan temples that were also centers of prostitution and sexual uh, activity. To sum it up, Corinth was a very wealthy, philosophical, religious, entertaining, immoral, and influential city of the first century. It was located at the crossroads between the East and the West. Corinth represented the very best and the very worst the city can offer. Despite the inherent challenges, Paul recognized a great opportunity for evangelism and expansion of the gospel that Corinth represented. And he spent around 18 months working and evangelizing in this important and strategic city. Last week, we examined how Christ can free us from any chains that are binding us. This week, we will examine the need for believers to remain persistent in their witness for Christ. By the end of the lesson, we hope you are encouraged to continue witnessing for Christ in spite of the seemingly godless surroundings and opposition. Now, connect, connect into my experience. I'm going to take a little sip of water here. <clears throat> okay, for many people, their first job is low paying but also physically demanding. As 
The question was, what jobs did you hold as a teenager? Well, I grew up on a farm where we started working or doing chores at an early age. My mother had a wood burning cook stove and our home was heated by a wood burning heater stove located in the living room. My first job was to keep the wood boxes filled. There was a wood box in the living room for the heater stove and one in the entryway for the cook stove. I was to be sure that they were filled each morning and each evening when I was about eight years old. Sometimes in the cold New England winters, they required an extra filling of the heater box, wood box in the afternoon. I will not go through the several other jobs I had on the farm as I grew older, but there were many. After graduating from high school, I went to work during the summers for a local handyman. We made repairs to older buildings. We built an addition to a cabin on the lake and we repurposed a barn. But most of our work was related to house painting during the summer times. So what were some of the most challenging jobs or work you have done? That's the second question here. Well, after I completed college, I went into construction management. After five years of what might be called on the job training with the Wyoming Highway Department, I became a supervisor uh, or as some would refer to it, I became the boss. I have managed teams during doing construction oversight on roads, bridges, water treatment plants, coal fired power plants, a short railroad and large pump stations in the Everglades. The most challenging part was always dealing with contractors to ensure that the plans, contract and specifications were followed so that the end result was a high quality project. Our transition here. In today's lesson, we will read about Paul joining up with Priscilla and Aquila to work as a tin maker. Paul was a highly educated and well-respected religious leader, but instead of capitalizing on his education and place in society, he chose to return to his previous profession of tent making that required demand and labor to support himself and his ministry. In the eyes of some, that would have lowered his status. As we read and discuss the scriptures, consider how this choice might have impacted his ministry. Okay, connecting with the word here. We're going to read our first section is verses, Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogues, trying to, to persuade Jews and Greeks. These few verses include a lot of names and places, right? For a few verses. So who is listed and where did they travel? Well, first we see Paul traveling from Athens to Corinth. In Corinth, Paul finds Aquila, native of Pontus, with Priscilla, his wife, who had traveled from Italy to Corinth. And we can also see Claudius, who I guess he just stayed in Rome. Now remember, traveling in the first century 
was both difficult and dangerous. We didn't have to worry about traffic on I-95 or on the highway, but um, they had other things that uh, were more dangerous probably. Um, roads, uh, outlaws and other things that would, uh, it was difficult. So let me take another sip here. So why were Paul, Aquila and Priscilla traveling? Well, last week in chapter 16, we saw that Paul had been beaten and jailed in Philippi. Once the people there found out Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they released him, but still asked him to leave town. In chapter 17, you can read about the travels and ministries in several towns and cities. Because of opposition from the Jews, uh, they kept moving around. That opposition followed them to Berea. Now, Paul was taken from there to Athens because of the opposition to wait for Silas and Timothy to show up. Now, while in Athens, uh, where there are many gods uh, worshipped, Paul debated that gods made of wood and stone and metal were not gods at all and taught them about the one true God and his son. Then in chapter 18, we see Paul still waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him, but moving on to Corinth. So Priscilla and Aquila were traveling because the Roman Empire, Emperor Claudius said, ordered all Jews to uh, leave Rome. So why do you think Paul chose to join in with Aquila and Priscilla as tent makers rather than use his education to join in with the Jewish religious leaders and share in their income? Well, I think I think by this time, Paul understood a large share, if not most all of his opposition to the gospel came from the Jewish leaders. And the crowds, they stirred up. Paul had also tried to support his ministry and not give room for people to falsely accuse him by saying he was only preaching this new gospel for the money. Paul wanted them to know the gospel was given freely. I also believe his decision provided him with Christian fellowship since Aquila and Priscilla were believers who Paul could hang out with and uh, who could, and they could share a craft together. They were tent makers and they could share a ministry. According to verse four, Paul's reason, Paul reasoned with the Jews and Gentiles in the synagogue every Sabbath. So what does that tell us about Paul's focus? You know, Paul had always gone first to the synagogue to give the Jews an opportunity to repent. There would also be Gentiles at the synagogue who were interested in and informed about the Jewish religion. This would give them, the Gentiles, a starting point for connection with the gospel. It seems to me that Paul's focus was presenting the good news to whoever would listen. Now we're gonna read uh, verses five through five and six here. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood is on your own head. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. (laughs) 
in my introduction, <coughs> I re excuse me. <coughs> um, yeah, in my introduction, we re I referred to a um, godless surroundings and opposition. According to verse five and six, where did Paul encounter opposition? Well, the Jews opposed the teaching of the gospel by Paul, even to the point of becoming abusive. So what was Paul's reaction to their opposition? Well, in verse six, we see Paul shake the dust off his clothes and protest to them. And Paul tell the Jews their blood was on their own head if they refused the gospel. Paul also tells them that he was going to turn to the Gentiles with the gospel. You know, shaking off your clothes in the, is the way ancient Hebrews declared they were finished with you. I'm done with you. For example, we read in Nehemiah 5, 12b through 13a. Then I summoned the priest and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out your house and possessions, shake out their house and possessions, anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. Also, we can read in Matthew 10, 14, where Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your word, leave the home or town and shake the dust off your feet. It's an indication that uh, I'm done with you talking to you. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know why I got so much coughing going on this morning. So where would you expect to encounter similar opposition today? I think we would expect this type of opposition in Islamic nations from their leaders and followers. We might see it among certain other anti-Christian groups. We might see it in schools and, and politics where they insist that we have to separate the church and the state. There are still places we can find opposition. So all of these, uh, they're still religious leaders who violently oppose people like Paul, who par passionately preach the gospel explain. Well, that's Paul who's passionately speaking the gospel, by the way. Okay. There is still violent opposition to the gospel in various areas of the world. The opposition can be very violent where the gospel is being presented to indigenous populations that practice their own traditional form of religion. And there can even be Nonviolent opposition from non evangelical church leaders at times. Surprisingly, it seems that Paul found a more hospitable welcome in the secular world of Corinth, a city known for its sinful depravity and immorality. Why do you think? He was more welcome there than among the religious. Well, in Corinth, there were many gods that were worshiped. And the average Gentile would probably be polytheistic and be looking at the gospel as a presentation of just another new God. And they may want to know more to determine the value of worship in this new God. So they may have been more open to hearing what was going on. Now, the average Jew was monotheistic. 
mean he worshipped only the one God and they were being taught by their religious leaders that the gospel was actually blasphemy and false teachings about their own God. So there was a big difference here and a lot of it came from the leadership you know, in the area and the people's uh, present religious background. If Paul were preaching today, where do you think he would be welcome and where do you think he would be rejected? Well, if Paul showed up today and preached like he did in the first century, I would hope that he would be accepted by evangelical churches. I think we know he would still be rejected by many Orthodox Jews, by Muslims, and probably by new age and new religious movements, as well as those who consider themselves agnostics and uh, atheists. We're going to read the next uh, section of verses, verses 7 through 11 here. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus, Justice a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So in light of the opposition of the leaders in the synagogue, Paul left. Verse 7 tells us that he went next door to the house of Titus Justus a Gentile worshiper of God. What does verse eight tell us about Paul's ongoing ministry? I think it tells us that Paul kept on preaching the gospel and that there was more success than he may have expected or understood even. When he moved the meeting next door, we see that the synagogue leader <clears throat> and his family believed and i think they may have moved too to go next door because later we see a different uh, synagogue leader we know that many of the cities believed many in the city believed in the lord and were baptized and that god had more people in the city than paul even realized i think looking at verse 9 and 10 what are three things that God told Paul to do? First, God told Paul, <clears throat> do not be afraid. You know, that is generally God's opening line when having a conversation with a human. Do not be afraid. Remember, when you pray, God has told you to do not be afraid. The second thing was to keep speaking and the third was to not be silent to me god was telling paul do not look at the opposition stay focused on the gospel so what are the three assurances that paul that god offered paul First, God reminded Paul that he was with him. Then God pointed out, no one is going to attack or harm Paul. In other words, God hid Paul's back. Finally, God tells Paul, I have many people in this city. 
In other words, Paul, you are not alone. And you are reaching people. So, can those three assurances encourage us today? Well, my answer is yes. Of course, we should be encouraged. God had not. God has not. And does not change. So we can count on God to be with us. We can count on God to have our back. And we know we are not alone. We are part of the body of Christ. So let the Holy Spirit be your guide when you uh, are witnessing. So how did Paul respond to the message of God? Well, Paul trusted God and stayed in Corinth and kept teaching for a year and a half. So what can we learn from Paul's example? Trust God and spread the gospel. You know, we do not need to fear. God is with us. And there are more Christians out there than we even know, probably. Today, we may have the freedom to share our faith. But that doesn't mean we won't face, excuse me, we won't face opposition. How should we respond when people oppose our ministry? You know, I think we need to remember we are speaking the truth. But that is not a call to get into an intense argument. In our mind, we can shake off the dust from our clothes and move on to share with someone who will realize they need the Lord. But we need to treat those who oppose or reject the gospel with God's love and grace and pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sins so that they will repent sometime in the future. Remember, God calls us to present the gospel. Only Jesus can save someone. We are to point them the way to God's son. We're going to read the next section here, verses 12 through 18. While Galileo was called proconsul, Galileo was proconsul of uh, Caesia, whatever, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowds, then the crowd there turned on Sosomnes, Sosthenes, yeah, okay, whatever, the uh, synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatever. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sinchias because of a vow he had taken. I know I, I murdered some of those words there, but uh, 
It's my, not my strong suit of pronouncing these words. Okay. Verse 12 tells us of a united attack against Paul. The Jews brought up a, a united attack and to take care of Paul. So what was the charge against Paul? Now, for me, Paul was being accused of being successful at preaching the gospel. They said, he is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. That means people, Jews and Gentiles alike, were repenting and becoming Christians. So, and it was a new religion and they weren't supposed to be changing religions, I guess. So in verse 18, we are told that Paul sailed for Syria with Priscilla and Aquila and that Priscilla and Aquila were with him. In Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 16, verse 3, he called Priscilla and Aquila his co-workers in Christ. In what way have you been a co-worker in Christ with others? Well, in my particular case here, I have done different things. I've been on the church board. I've been a Sunday school superintendent. I've done pulpit supply. Uh, I've been part of a vegetation, vegetation, no, uh, vegetation, but visitation team to reach people in the church community, neighborhood. I've preached a revival. I've um, gone on work and witness trips. I support the pastor and other Christians in prayer. And I've led building projects and a few other things. That's, uh, I've tried to, uh, to work for God in uh, all kinds of ways that uh, he opens up. And we need, as Christians, need to be able to do that. So how can we foster a co-worker mentality in the church? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that we are all part of the body of Christ and that each part is important. So the ministry of church belongs to all Christians. For the ministry of the church to be successful, every part of the body needs to uh, see it as their ministry. It is not just the pastors or the church boards or the Sunday school teachers ministry. Every member of the church needs to be a co-worker. Just like any organization, everyone doesn't do the same thing. But all the parts fit together to make it work as it should. You know, you may be the guy with the oil can that keeps the engine running smoothly by squirting a little oil in the right place at the right time. Or maybe you're the church co-worker saying a little prayer at the right time to make the ministry work well and enable someone to find the Lord. Remember, if you attend a church, you are part of the body of Christ and you are a co-worker in that ministry. Connect to my life in the world here. <clears throat> Excuse me. The characterization of the city of Corinth as a depraved, godless place, while true in many ways, can distract us from noticing who welcomed the gospel and who rejected it in these verses. After a quick review of this section, who do you notice Paul received Paul and who rejected him? You know, it appeared that the average citizen listened 
and some received the gospel that Paul taught. While the religious elite rejected Paul and the gospel. You know, unfortunately, it was the religious people who rejected the good news that Jesus was a Messiah and instead responded with opposition and violence. Now, here's a little homework for you to think about. As the people of God in today's world, this gives us opportunity to examine our own lives. Are we accepting of God's grace, mercy, love, and salvation? Whenever and wherever we encounter it, Are there certain people that we look at and think, oh, they're not, they're not really Christians. Even if the good news, the second thought here, even if the good news comes from those who are considered outsiders, are we able to look past our assumptions about people's status and place in the world? to see how God might be using them to spread the gospel. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we know as your child, we had to show your, show your loving grace to all so that some may come to a saving knowledge of your son. God, examine our hearts if there be any animosity and anger towards those who do not meet our expectations of how you are worshiping in the world today. Please cleanse our hearts and enable us to be people who extend hospitality to, the other, to others, no matter how they look on the outside. God, Give us hearts that are receptive and tender to your leading. Tune our heart to receive the Holy Spirit's prompting as to when and to who we are to share the gospel and to what we are to say. Also, God, give the heart and mindset of a co-worker in the ministry of the church. Lord, we also pray for those who need a touch of healing and comfort from you. We think particularly of uh, Sister Consuela, Jay and Debbie, Tom and Lily, Alonzo, Terry, Ron and Sandy, Sister Leanna, and others. We also pray for the ministry of our friends in Liberia. May God richly bless your ministry. Amen. Now, a little closing, closing thought here. Remember, during the first century, the gospel spread across the then known limits of civilization by the church. Those courageous individuals we now call saints were just ordinary believers like you and me who were filled with the spirit of Christ and who completely dedicated to the good news of salvation that is ours in Jesus. There are still those who have not heard and who were lost and who oppose the gospel. What has God trusted to you? Well, that is the end of our lesson for today and for this week. And uh, we hope you have a good week and, and uh, good services on Sunday. 
And remember, God loves you, and so do I.